Hey, just some learning friends. How's everybody going out there? Welcome, and we're so excited to have you guys here today. You're our very first in this series called Living with Nature, brought to you by the North Carolina Zoo. It's for middle schoolers and high schoolers uh, in a distance learning program, kind of sharing a lot of the you things that are revolving volume. around the North Carolina Zoo's mission. We would like to uh, acknowledge and express no. some really cool gratitude to Wells Fargo. No. Wells Fargo um, were able to provide grant funds to keep this project to. going. So we appreciate them very, very much. My name is Steve, and I'm one of the zoo educators here. My name is Leslie, and I'm also a zoo educator here. And I'm Natalie. I'm a senior at Ashmore High School, and actually attend some classes here at the zoo. Today, I will be sharing some information with you and keeping these two in mind. <laughs> You're with me today. <laughs> Whatever. We are actually your three <laughs> hosts for today, and I'm going to be sending these two yeah, guys well, over. Ready? Bye, guys. See you I'll later. See you in a few. Have fun. Uh, we'll be checking back with them um, after we meet our first expert. So, a couple of quick things, though, before we get started, we um, do have a couple of ways to help you be interactive during today. You may have noticed when you came into the digital classroom that your mics are muted as default, but that doesn't mean that you can't interact with us. We do have that chat box up, so you can um, ask any questions that you have. There's even a hand raise um, as well, some thumbs up, thumbs down, if you're not understanding what's going on. So why don't we um, go ahead and try that chat box out, and let's write in where you all are watching from. Now here, we're in Randolph County. We're in Asheboro, North Carolina at the North uh, Carolina Zoo. And we hope Unless to have I, I mean, all I over um, watching with us today. Somebody. And so I could just pull them. Quick things we do if yeah, you yeah, if we aren't able to answer yeah. your questions um, during the actual live event. We will be able to answer them afterwards and we're gonna put them on our website. So check back at the Living With Nature webpage in the next couple of days for some of those um, for some of those answers to the questions, as well as this video, because it is being recorded, more on this thing and um, some other things that we might be able to put up on there. Um, so all of those things will hopefully help you be interactive today and make this fun and exciting. And um, no I think actually I see, well, I don't see him yet, but I think I hear our first um, expert behind me. Because um, as I go walk over to meet him, if you guys want to see him in action. Yeah, hey friends, so while we're waiting on George, we just ask that if you can keep on the chat going to only questions, and that'll help us make sure we answer as many of those as we're going throughout the program today. I think he's coming back. Forsyth County and Leesville Middle and Wake County. We're super excited that you're joining us today. Uh, make sure that poll is up and that you're answering it. I see our friend coming over right now. Hey. Hey, how are you? Hey everybody, this is George. Now, um, George has a lot of fun, fun names. 
but I like to call him the Poop Smith. Um, but this is also known as the King of Poop. This is his poopdom. Um, anything that has to do with what we have going on here is uh, uh, it's a playing video art and playing video. Oh, this is live? Uh, yeah. It's a live webinar. Yeah. And not saying that. There's a lot about food. Okay. When you unplug it, you take that off oh, the screen. What's we're really Try it again. and uh you can see right here this is where two thousand tons yeah. of rice comes in. Yeah, I'm doing it. It's like four million pounds. Wow. <laughs> and then uh, um you saw what I was doing with that machine making all that smoke, which is really just steam. You might think this whole thing is like magic, but Actually, it's science. It's all about science, and it starts with the right ingredients. We can hear it on here. Yeah, no trouble. We got the animals. We got the real poop makers. See, this pile right here is some of our prized elephant poop. Um, when you're making compost, like I said, it's science. You want the best ingredients, and the best way to make compost is get like 30 parts of the material being your browns or your carbon and this grass right here this is this is good carbon and I'm horticulture here I'm the food microphone runs on about 400 uh, tons of stuff like this down every year got it and then you take that 30 parts of that add it to one part nitrogen thing on the computer that we get for yeah, all of our animals pretty much at the zoo. Nitrogen in a ball. Yes, I'm awesome. This okay. elephant is actually poop is the star of the show because they give us two and a half tons every day yeah. of this material. But I will want to mention another star animal that gives us this little thing, and that's the giraffes. So the giraffes, their quantity is not as big, but their quality is considered the best. Good. Too. Huh, I didn't know that. <laughs> but once I get all that material together, about once a month, I start making an active windrow. That's what's over here. Okay. And you saw me mixing, turning with this machine. What I want to do is get uh, it's kind of like baking lasagna, and when you get finished, you get chocolate cake. And what's really cool now, you don't even need an oven because it makes its own oven. Okay. okay. That's kind of why it looks so like it's on fire right yeah, now, smoking. Yeah. yeah, it's smoking because uh, if you get the right ingredients and start mixing them up and putting air into it, mm -hmm. you're going to start cooking all those materials. And it's going to start breaking down. This was only started and looked just like this stuff two weeks ago. But since then, I've turned it, mixed mm -hmm. it five times, and you're now seeing almost starting, you know, to look soil like. Okay. Are we able to go over and see how hot yeah. it is over here? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. It's not trying to do what? I'm at about 152. Wow. I have to get it up to 131 for 15 days, turn it five times during that time. But it always shoots up to like 150, 160. That better? And you can see that I can go in there with this thing and really get, wow, yeah. get into the pile. Um, uh, yeah, pretty nice compost pile that we have. So what, yeah. this compost pile, what happens after this? After this, after I do the five times in 15 days, turning it, mm -hmm. then I'm gonna turn it once a month. And that's what those other piles back there are. Those have been turned along the way until I get temperatures of 110. When the temperatures drop down, that tell you that it's finished. And the uh, typical time is about four months. Okay. And so in four months, I can get something that is waste that nobody really wants and turn it into this, which for a gardener is considered black gold. Huh. And uh, See, this is the good stuff right here. Some good. When those pop so what do we do? We've carried all of this stuff from the zoo. Um, that waste from the zoo, which actually, as we're talking about that, we probably have our poll results. So could you answer for us uh, about how much percentage of waste we turn into compost here at the zoo? 
we uh, estimate about 85%. Wow, 85%. Yeah. Awesome. So if you guys got 85%, good job. <laughs> So one of the I, new things okay. we've been doing I don't know if you know yeah, you know it's over there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it kinda looks like somebody had a picture. It's a little kick. different, right? Yeah. This is uh, our waste of vegetables and dinnerware from the restaurants at the zoo. Okay. And uh, they have just started using this compostable dinnerware. So now when you go to the restaurant, everything you buy can pretty much be composted. So they can bring uh, visitors are able to put it in a container that goes to compost. So that's, that's um, uh, uh, two and a half times uh, uh, What a great change, yeah, so we can take everything that we have, that we use in our food services and bring it over here to the compost pile as well to make compost. So it looks like we have a question. Great. One of our questions is, why is it so hot? Why? Great, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I talked about layering it to make it kind of like lasagna, you know, kind of, the, kind of like baking. Well, if you layer things right, then what you get, you get all the microbes that you want to go to work for you. And that's what's making all the, the temperature shoot up, is the microbes consuming the, the waste. Okay. And uh, they're... Are, uh, are really doing the work for me. I'm just kind of kind of like farming microbes and fungi, and that's why also I love my job because I'm always getting fungi. <laughs> 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 we always like a good pun. Yeah. It looks like we have another question. question. How often do you get this stuff? Well, the waste I get every day. Thank you. This is being collected. In my last two weeks and like I said every month I will start a new windrow so 2,000 tons you know coming in over the course of a year and then when you cook it all down you don't get every bit of that back as compost because it breaks down right. and a lot of it's moisture and that's what's steaming off that pile is that moisture so in the end out of 2,000 tons I end up with like 600 tons of this beautiful finished compost. Our black gold. black gold. We have another question. Yes. Where does it go once it leaves here when it's oh, ready? Great question. Yes. Well, here at the zoo, because we are such a, a large zoo, for one, and the horticulture here at the zoo, the plants are just really as important as the animals. Oh, very for much the so. look and all mm -hmm. that. And for the enrichment of the animals. Mm -hmm. Uh, we use every bit that we make in the gardening that we do, the landscaping that we do here at the zoo. And that's one of the really cool things about this whole process. Uh, it is about sustainability and no, and everything the zoo tries to do is about sustainability, really. But composting is a perfect example of how you take something that nobody wants, you start with that waste, and then you turn it into compost. And then we use the compost in one aspect to grow shrubs and other vegetables for the animals. Okay, so it cool. makes a complete circle. They eat that, turn it into more poop, more compost, <laughs> and it just makes a circle, but it's sustainability. Very cool. Oh, it looks like we have another question. Um, the products that you don't use for compost, do you burn trash at the zoo or how do we get rid of the trash here? We do not burn anything here at the zoo uh, for trash. Uh, we do uh, have a, a, a dumpsters that the landfill or take to the landfill mm -hmm. for just regular non-compostable, non-recyclable, which we have really got everything down to about 85%. We're recycling, reusing, or composting. Very cool. Another question? Uh, very important question. What does it smell like here? Oh, <laughs> you want some? <laughs> you know, so it doesn't smell bad at all. Great, it is also winter, so yes. you know, it's not yes. cooking, I guess, is hard. But if anybody's ever been to a farm or worked on a farm, um, it kind of does smell like a barnyard around here. Elephant poop smells a lot like a barnyard. Um, and I would say, even though we have so much of it here, you don't really smell it at all. It's That's fairly correct. pleasant. Well. I try to keep it, the odors down, 
for one, I'm it's part of the law of the land. Okay. North Carolina, you have to mm. keep, or if you become a nuisance to your neighbors, then you can get in trouble. But we've never had any complaints. And a lot of it's just like keeping your uh, nitrogen covered with your carbon. Okay. And just, you know, covering things. And uh, so putting those plants basically yeah, on top yeah. of all the poop. So yeah. It Keeps and that smell down. Speaking of, you know, what I'm required to do, I'm also required to do tests of everything that is finished. Once it reaches the finished compost, I do a test for heavy metals and also for pathogens like salmonella. Can we do one last question? Or? Yes. I think some of our viewers are confused and keep asking where the animals are. Ah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we have the stuff that comes out of the animals here. We are we're actually behind the scenes right now at our compost area. So, um we are since we're learning about green practices today, we thought we'd talk about one of the really cool or a couple of the really cool ones we have. And sometimes that doesn't include actually seeing the animals, but it includes seeing what we do behind the scenes. So, this is actually an area you would never be able to see. Um, and I don't know about you, but I think it's pretty amazing to see how this actually works on such a large scale since we're a 500-acre um, um, zoo. But we, we're going to have to wrap it up real quick. We wanted to thank you so You're much, welcome. George, for coming yes. and hanging out with us, learning all the cool stuff about composting. And I'm actually going to head it um, all the way over to another place with our next expert, with Steve and Natalie. Oh, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Live, yay. <laughs> uh, we're not going to head it over there yet. But um, so a couple of quick things is, even though this is kind of like a large scale compost area, composting is something that you can do at home relatively easily. And um, you don't need a lot of stuff to do it. Uh, that could be something that you research for your project, maybe. Must so have been we when they are were doing now going to stuff. hand it over to Steve and Natalie, who are with our next expert. Hey guys, thanks Leslie. That was kind of cool. Isn't it neat to hear about some of the cool composting things that are going on over there? Well, I have another one of our green gurus here at the North Carolina Zoo, our Sultan of Sustainability. This is Bob Langston. And it's some real... Wait a minute. What? You forgot to remind them to use the chat box to check in with us or use their emojis to tell us how they're feeling. Also, a poll is up, so please check out. Thanks, Natalie. Well, I keep here today, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, hey, so Bob, check this out. Natalie and I came over. Yeah. We, we came on that big parking lot up there. Okay. You know, you know, if you've been to the North Carolina Zoo, there's a parking lot you come in. But then you told, you asked us to meet you down here. It's a really kind of cool pond situation. What gives over here? Well, it's really a great question, Steve. Uh -huh. and, and here's sort of, let me explain. Uh, where we're standing right now is a constructed wetland. And I say constructed, this is not a natural wetland. And I'll explain more about that as we go. But as you mentioned, we have lots of parking lots. Annually, mm -hmm. uh, the zoo has about 850,000 visitors, and they come in cars all the time. We have some that come in buses, and we have to have places for them to park. So over here, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40 to 50 acres of hard asphalt surface uh, parking areas. And now, acres, I don't mean, an well, acres about a football field, right? Right, about right, a football field. about a football field. So okay. it's a large area, cool. and it's covered with a hard surface so that when it rains, the water doesn't seep into the ground. That's actually a good thing, because if it was, it would be nothing but a big mud pit out there. So what happens is whenever it rains, the rain lands on the parking lot, and it goes into a series of vents and drains and comes out into that lake over there. Now, one of the problems happens because cars have a nasty tendency, not all of them, but some of them leak chemicals. It's mm -hmm. things like brake fluid, motor oil, gasoline, antifreeze, and various chemicals like that. So when they leak, it lands on the surface over there. And rather than having that go into the lake, we constructed this wetland as a filter. Now, it doesn't look like a lot right now because we're here in January. You can tell I'm not wearing shorts. Everybody's got on a jacket. It's kind of chilly out here today. I was checking the temperature. It's about 34 right now. Uh, we do have a little bit of residual ice on the surface of the water here. This water is not deep. It's very, very shallow. And it is a filter. Uh, this was actually uh, constructed using the Clean Water Management Trust Fund money and uh, co-designed by the Department of Transportation. But what it does is whenever it rains, the water runs into here first. 
And these plants that you've seen when we panned across, the plants themselves, when they're growing and in season, it's mice and lush and green. Uh, the plants actually help slow that water down. And as the water slows down before it goes into the lake, anything that's suspended in that water tends to want to settle out. Well, so, yeah. yeah. The sun slows everything down. Won't it not be able to do its job? Well, in theory, yes. Uh, one of the worst forms of water pollution we have is called silt. It's just dirt in the water. Now, if you look around as we pan across, you'll see that the banks of the pond here of the wetland are covered in grasses and needle rush. And of course, uh, I mentioned that the water is washing off the uh, asphalt, off the parking lot surface. If this were a natural wetland, two things would be really different. Yes, there would be a lot more dirt in it, but when it rains here, it picks up stuff that's on the parking lot surface. Now, sometimes that's chemicals, sometimes it's cigarette filters. There is going to be some dirt, but not as much as you get in natural wetland. Natural wetland would not have that dam that you see over that way. That's uh, off to our uh, left over there. Uh, the dam itself uh, actually traps the water and it keeps everything intact. Now, on a natural wetland, you wouldn't have that. You'd have a shallow area and it would clean itself. Every time you get a real heavy rain, it would scour the dirt out and would wash it on downstream. Here, what happens is the dirt, the uh, water itself gets trapped, and this area can filter a one inch rain event uh, every seven days. Now, for those of you who are local to the Piedmont in North Carolina, you realize last fall we got a lot more than one inch every seven days. But what happens is, as the water slows down, ultimately you're right. If, if we got a lot more dirt, this would fill in, and ultimately it would become a big old mud pit, and ultimately enough plants would come in, and it would become an open field. Kind of like a bathtub. Kind of like a bathtub. So in order to keep that from happening, we actually have to monitor it. We check the depth of this once or twice a year. When we check the depth of the water, what we're looking for is to see how much is filled in. If we get too much, yes, you're right, we'll have to do something. We'll have to come in and scoop everything out. And that would probably do some damage to the plants, so we would have to plant them again. Uh, everything in here we planted uh, when we first uh, started this area. Um, this was constructed back in the 2007-2008 uh, time frame, so it's only been here for about two years. So uh, that's kind of how that works. But yeah, you're right. So let me see if I have this right. Okay. Okay. This wetland was constructed on purpose. Correct. The purpose being to untap the wetland. It filters the water. Yes. Um, it drops just enough and slows down just enough to be able to fill up. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And when it fills up. The water spills out over this way uh, to my left to see there's a pier and under the pier is actually, it's like a staircase. So that when it's raining a little bit, a little bit of water runs out. If it rains really hard, more water will run out. So it can actually let out two or three different levels of food crystal filling up and everything like that. So that's one of the things that we try to do uh, in order to maintain this area. It's really kind of cool though. If you come back in about two or three months in March and April, the area is going to be full of green plants. I mean, we're talking about amazing. There'll be these some that grow this high off the water and they have beautiful purple flowers, arrowhead and pickerel weed. We'll have lily pads on the top. We have pretty white and pink blooms. And you'll see all these rushes and things. We have cattails. Cattails grow really high and everything like that. Those are great plants in the wetland. They can live completely submerged. And because they can live submerged and everything like that, they are allowed to do their job. And we do get these nice rafts of roots under here. So occasionally, if you're ever walking in this, and I do, uh, you'll be walking and you're walking in the mud, and your feet are kind of getting stuck. And then all of a sudden, you pick something you think, whatever, you have to sort of step up, you step up onto a raft of those roots. And those actually help absorb some of that water too. So not only does it slow it down, but it soaks up water to keep it from flooding further downstream. So what about this? I know that we we do some we do some really cool stuff out here. We've done some dipping and things like that. I do know that it can sometimes smell a little funny. Yeah. We what, do. What, what's that all about? Okay. I know this is going to sound kind of big, maybe a little gross, but if you can think of this, this is actually kind of a great big pot of vegetable soup that's constantly refreshing itself. So as the plants grow up, sometimes they die and fall over. They fall to the bottom and break down. And when they break down, they become this material called detritus, which is kind of a food for a lot of critters that would live here. Now, as it's breaking down, some of the critters use air. 
We call those aerobic. So that may be anything from like little bitty bugs, bacteria, and fungus and stuff like that. And those animals, uh, organisms rather, actually give off a gas which is called hydrogen sulfide. And hydrogen sulfide, oh, you get a nice sulfury smell. So if you get out here and start walking around and we stir up the mud on the bottom, it's gonna uh, smell so just a little bit. bit. But that hydrogen sulfide is actually good too because there's another whole community of decomposing organisms that have to use that. They breathe that in and they give off oxygen. Cool, thank yeah. you very much. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Hey, so we heard some things from Bob, some really cool stuff. I want to ask you guys, do you have any questions you might want to ask Bob while we're out and about? Um, Natalie, I'll go do a little review for you in a second to look at that poll question. Any questions for us? Yeah, we got one over there. What do you do with all the dirt when you dig it out? What do we do with all the dirt when we dig it out? That's a great question. Now, one of the things that happens when the stuff washes in off the parking lot, it can carry things like oil and it can carry things like heavy metals. Uh, heavy metals can be anything from iron. So we we oh. had a beautiful uh, a red pileated woodpecker oh. back here a little while oh. ago. But uh, sometimes uh, it can have little bits and pieces of lead, mercury, cadmium, and beryllium. And those are materials, as, uh, uh, as Natalie pointed out, that as the water slows down, they sink. So they can be in the mud. So whenever we get this mud, we have to test it. We'll send it up to North Carolina State. We get tested for heavy metal. Now, if it doesn't have a lot, we can actually mix it with the compost and make potting medium out of it. It's really fine and it has nutrients in it because the plant matter that's in it. The problem is if it does have those materials in it, in that case, we have to uh, scoop it up, put it into a dump truck and take it over and put it underneath some other dirt in a big hole oh, in the ground. Like Phil. Yes, like that's Phil. Cool. That's a great question. Yep. Anybody else have any questions out there for us? Is that okay for the wetland to do that? Is it okay for us to dig out the to dig out the dirt? Is it okay for the wetland? It has a recovery time if we do have to dig it out. Like I said, all of the plants that are here, we had to plant oh, originally. originally. When we uh, built this area, uh, we had to bring some dirt in, and we didn't actually uh, uh, bring it in from any place special. Well, okay, we brought it in from Africa. Uh, when we built this area to begin with, uh, it was right about the same time we were renovating uh, the uh, uh, elephant exhibit. Not so we had to move Africa. some dirt out of the way uh, <laughs> to make room for the elephant. We just put it in the dump truck and piled it over that way, uh, and it was a big red dirt hill. So uh, in order to do some repairs on the main dam over here, we drained the lake down. And when we did, we started building the wetland. So when we first filled it up, there was nothing here. There was just water. So we came in and actually had to plant all these plants. So if we have to scoop the top layer of dirt off the bottom, the clay that's on the bottom stays put. And it's really good because clay packs down and it helps hold the water. If we have to clean it out, we'll probably have to replant it. Yeah, that's cool. This is awesome, guys. Great job. Anybody else have anything they want to know about the wetlands while we have our expert here? How does the water get there? Got a question. How does the water get here? Rain. Uh, that's the great thing about uh, the parking lots over here. Because we have somewhere, like I said, between 40 and 50 acres, I think 40 to 50 football fields, it's a big parking lot. And it's not level. So there are drains. So occasionally, if you look around on the edge right now, especially since we don't have any plant cover, you can see drain pipes. Yep. And the drain pipes come from different parts of the, uh, uh, of the parking lot. The uh, water goes into the drain and it comes here. Now it's interesting you would ask that. Water can come from uh, a lot of places. Where it goes matters than more than where it comes from. Where it goes, if we were actually going to trap this water and pump it into the sewer, we would call that wastewater, even though it rains in the sky. Because this runs out into the lake and ultimately into the Cape Fear River, we call it stormwater. And stormwater is not filtered by any sort of treatment process. So without this area that would slow the oil down, and there are organisms that actually eat that oil. Oil is nothing but a compound of hydrogen and carbon. And you have to have a particular enzyme in order to break it down. We don't. So if we eat oil, it makes us not feel very good. But <laughs> there are sense. organisms that can do that. And so those are here all the time. So if we do get a little gasoline, a little oil, a brake fluid, or anything down. like that, they can break it down. It's not a fast process. So it does require time. 
And that's one of the big deals about wetlands. They're not fast, they go on their own time schedule and things like that. That's awesome. That's cool stuff. It is so neat. But uh, well, I would like to thank you so much for coming sure. out and visiting with us today. Ah. So I know you've got things you guys yeah. take care of. So wasn't <laughs> wasn't that cool hearing from Bob? You can right. scoot out, man. You can take off. Oh, yeah, I'm going right. to, uh, excuse me, I'm going to. Thank you, Bob. guys. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. That's so cool to think about. They actually built this uh, whole thing to slow down the water, uh, to take care of the runoff, um, to clean the water that's going in. That's kind of a neat thing. Yeah, to think and about. I think it's also great that the zoo has plans in place for when it fills up, they can dig it out. It's a great tool to see. It is so cool. And all the animals that this might provide habitat to. Yeah. Hey, Bob. Yo! You said no, this might provide habitat for animals, right? Absolutely. This place is full of critters. There was a gorgeous bird right in the tree right behind yeah. you a little while ago and everything. Man, we've got all kinds of stuff. If you yeah. get in here and poke around, you're going to find bugs and insects. You're yeah. going to find salamanders. You're going to find tadpoles and frogs. You find crawdads with their little pinchery things and stuff like that. You're going to find even big turtles and stuff like that. We got fish in here. There's a few mammals. You can look behind you and see a place where we've had some muskrats and some beavers yeah, right. yeah. that have actually uh -huh. been digging up stuff. Yeah, yeah, so lots of stuff like lots that. Lots of cool birds. Lots of cool things. Absolutely. Awesome. And, Bob, and thank you so much. That's, fun. that's awesome. You sure? No, that's great. I, I can tell you more. Truly appreciate that. all that great information. Uh, okay, I'll, I think I'll that's, see you guys. That's, that's great. That's, that's, we got, that's awesome, Bob. Thank you so much. Whew. Boy, he knows so much about this space, and he, yeah, he's been around since the entire facility was put together. And again, it's kind of neat to think this place is going in. Here over at Zeusville, have you guys come over and checked this out before? Yes, we come down here, uh, we take water sample, samples over there. Zeusville is actually right over there. So oh, nice. The tree. That's kind of cool. I need to think about that. That is so neat. All right, guys, so that's it from here in the wetlands place, the constructed wetlands of North Carolina Zoo. We'd like to throw it back over to Leslie, and she's with another one of our experts. This one's kind of cool because it has an international flair. Check this out. Thanks, Bob, Natalie, and um, Steve. Yeah, nice yeah so we're here. We had two minutes left. We've learned a little bit about uh, compost. So, so that's, taking that that's from all of the animals and then also our food industry to make compost so that we can help the plants. We've learned about wetlands. And just as Steve said, we're gonna learn a little bit with some international flair now. Um, Cause did you know that you can actually do something, a green practice that saves specific animals? We're here with uh, Dr. Beth and she is going to tell us a little bit about some of the cool stuff that she does with Unite for the Education in West Africa, um, specifically, all right, East Africa, <laughs> East Africa, specifically in Uganda. <laughs> so yes, Unite for the Environment, not the education, but it is a conservation <laughs> education program that we do in Uganda, as you mentioned. Um, the program there, we're working with schools and teachers in Uganda, and we teach them how to do green practices. This program's been going for about 15 years. And we've done a lot in that time, but most recently we are focusing on the green practices, specifically green practices outside a certain national park, Kambali National Park. By any chance, Leslie, do you know what mm -hmm. Kambali National Park is famous for? Um, I think I've heard. So um, I heard it was an animal that, and if you guys have any thoughts, maybe you can throw it up there too. Um, it's an animal that a lot of people come here to the zoo to see, and they enjoy watching them interact with each other um, and learning how they have different kind of emotions than we, or how they, they show their emotions a little bit different than we do. Could it be the chimpanzees? You're right. It is the chimpanzees. So Kambali National Park is famous for their chimpanzee population. It's the largest in Uganda. So people will go there specifically to go chimp trekking. Have you ever been chimp trekking, Leslie? I can't say that I have. Not only our, our trek around the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely experience, let me tell you that. <laughs> but they have other animals at Kabali as well. They have leopards and they have mm. elephants and they have over 300 species of birds. So people go there for a variety of reasons. Okay. And as a national park, we want to do our best to protect it. So that's the reason why we're working with the communities outside of Kabali National Park. 
so how, how exactly are the green practices that we're doing with Unite for the Environment helping the, the chimpanzees? That's a really good question. So Linda is going to throw up a picture of our, one of the stoves that they traditionally use in Uganda. So it doesn't look like our stoves that we have at home. You'll notice that it's three bricks and they'll build a fire in between those bricks and put a pot on top of it. So you might imagine that this would lose a lot of heat mm -hmm. because the fire is just escaping everywhere. Right. So what we've started doing is teaching them how to make fuel efficient stoves. Um, and the next picture, you'll see what that looks like. It keeps the heat in so they use a lot less firewood. And now you can put your pot on top and it takes a lot less time and it cooks at a higher temperature. Okay, so basically the firewood, they would have to use so much firewood with the old style of stove that they would go into the park or the, the national park and get it. Is that what they would do? Yeah, you're okay. right. They would go into the park. So that's one of the bigger problems is encroachment on national parks. And that happens around the world, but mm -hmm. here in Uganda, they're going in to get firewood, so they'll collect down wood, and they'll also collect, cut down some of the smaller trees and bring that as well. So we're destroying the habitat okay. that all this wildlife needs. So that's the reason why we want to protect it. I see. So, and we've been working with um, Unite for the environment for quite, quite a while, right? Yes. So over 15 years okay. so far. Is, is there any, are there any other types of like green practices that we've, helped them with or have um, have helped with training on? Yeah, so one of the other green practices is we do trash pickups in the communities, just like you can do here. Um, so they'll go out, pick out trash, they'll sort it, and then they have incinerators that they'll burn the plastic trash, they'll compost what they can't, or what's compostable, and they'll reuse things that's reusable. So they get a lot of experience in of how to sort their waste and find ways to use it. Dang. Well, hold on though. Like I've always been told that burning plastic is bad. So how, how can it be oh, good for them to burn the plastic that they're finding over there? Burning plastic is bad in large, large quantities. Um, in this case, they're doing it infrequently. Okay. And if they didn't burn it, the plastic ends back up in the environment around us. Mm. So wildlife will start to eat it. The microplastics, as it breaks down, is becoming a huge problem in our environment. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the lesser of two evils okay. in this particular case. And are they using as much plastic as kind of we, we're getting rid of here? No, they okay. use a lot less. They're still using glass bottles for their soda, gotcha. and they do the returns and all that fun so stuff. So there's really not too much plastic, for sure. Um, so um, thanks so much, uh, Beth, for hanging out with us. We, we've we learned some pretty cool stuff here today. Um, like I said, we learned about our composting that we do, a green practice to help all that waste go into um, food for our plants that goes back into the plants that feed our animals, um, our constructed wetland that helps clean the water. Um, and then we also learned about some stuff that we we're doing in East Africa in Uganda um, to help with fuel efficient stoves and composting there as well. And then also incinerators for the, the, the kind of smaller amount of plastic that they have. I hope all of these ideas are starting to kind of get your brains, uh, your little uh, neurons firing, and those ideas are coming up for your project that you guys hopefully will be taking part in and working together with. And we're actually going to be um, going over to Lydia, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about those projects and help you guys out. Hey guys, I'm Lydia. I'm a teacher here in North Carolina and I teach online with North Carolina Virtual Public School. I wanted to come today to talk to you a little bit about the project-based learning opportunity that you have. So today you've actually spent a bit of time learning about composting. As Leslie said, you learned about how to protect our waters and then you just learned about ways in which people across the globe actually do some green practices themselves. So your job now, if you so choose to take it on as your um, mission, is to come up with something you can do in your community that would then help your community in a green practices sort of way. So we have sent out the information. If you don't have it in your hands, we will put it on the website for you, or it's already there anyway. 
Let's talk for a second about what that project could be. What you need to do is consider your community, consider some ways in which you can help your community, and get your community to uh, do some things that would fall under those green practices umbrella. So for instance, let's go real simple here. We all know about recycling, right? So recycling is simple. We need to put cardboard in the cardboard box, plastic in the plastic box, perhaps glass, newspaper, et cetera. But maybe your school or your community organization or somewhere around your community does not have recycling in place. So you as an individual or as a group, you want to make this become your project-based learning idea. So you will need to do some research. What is it going to take to get recycling started in your school or community building or wherever that is? So you wanna do the research first. What, what um, resources are you going to need? What information, who is going to need to help you? Because if you're a student, you're probably thinking, I don't have the resources, I don't know who I'm supposed to talk to. So you're gonna to wanna to find an adult or someone who could actually be that uh, piece of support for you. Then in doing that research, you want to start to put into place a plan. How are you going to make this happen so that your community will then benefit from the recycling program? Once you do that, you're gonna to have to implement it. You need to actually put it into place. And while you're putting it into place, you want to take some records. You wanna record the things that are going well and the things that aren't going so well. Because we all know in reality that not everything's gonna go perfectly. So you wanna keep track of the good things and the bad things. And then in the end, you will have not only the product, not only the implementation, but also your list of goods and bads, and you're going to reflect. So all of that is kind of the research paper portion of your project, because part of being a good research person or researcher is to actually do all that background stuff so that you can then create a product. So your end product for us here at the North Carolina Zoo is to actually turn this into something digital because you want to submit it to the zoo so that you can potentially win prizes. So the way to do that, there are three ways, and if you have questions, be sure to email us, but one of the ways is to create a video. So you can use whatever video process you would like. Some of you prefer iMovie or you just want to do it on Snapchat or however you would do it to explain the ways in which you took that project from thinking about it to actually implementing it and then seeing the end of that. So you might um, edit a video, however you wanna do that, and then submit the link to the video. So you wanna put it on uh, something like YouTube or Vimeo or somewhere like that that you can host it. Then you want, you could also, I'm sorry, another way you could do it is to actually just create a digital slideshow. So if you don't have access to video production pieces, which is understandable sometimes, you could actually create like a PowerPoint or a keynote and put it, use screen share uh, processes to then record that. There's our websites like Screencast-O-Matic and other places like that that are completely free and you can record and then you'll have a link and you could submit that. Um, another option would be to do something like a podcast. So this would mean recording your voice, similar to like a radio show. You're probably familiar with podcasts. And you would then explain all of the things that happened during your process. So again, going from this is what happened at the beginning, this was my idea, to this is then how I implemented it, to this is what went well and what didn't go well. All of that is a big reflection that you're putting in a digital format so that you can then share it out with the world. Then what will happen is we here at the North Carolina Zoo, we will evaluate them. So we have a rubric, it's already posted or will be posted and it's on the sheet that was sent to your teacher or your adult there that then tells you how it's rated. And the winners will then be posted on the North Carolina Zoo website at nczoo.org. And then, you know, everybody will know that you're the winner, right? Everybody wants to be the winner. So I, I don't know if there are any questions. If there are questions, let me know. In the meantime, consider some ways in which you can actually create the product uh, or a project. So you, again, could do recycling. You could attempt to start some compost heaps. Um, I've done that in my backyard and it's actually a lot easier than you think. Your parents might have coffee. That's an easy way to start a compost. Um, eggs, if you eat them, that's another easy way. And newspapers. So those are three really easy things to put together to start composting right in your own backyard. 
And you don't even have to get much fancy equipment or spend a lot of money to do that. Recycling, of course, is also a very easy one. You just need to find a resource to take the recycling to. Um, you may even want to consider ways in which you could just simply reduce the water usage in your house or even the electricity usage in your house. All of those are green practices that you could implement. If you're still not sure what in the world you could possibly talk about or do or implement, go on to nczoo.org and look at our living, uh, living with Nature Practices live site where we have the green practices links and we will give you some opportunities and some ideas there. All right, I hope to see tons of projects coming in from you all. And now we're gonna scoot it on over to our next site. Thanks, Lydia. Appreciate that great information on what's going on around here. All right, so it's me again, Steve with Natalie. Yep, this is Zoo School. So we've been doing some really cool stuff out and about. Um, really neat things about what the zoo is doing for green practices and trying to make a difference for the world that's out there, even in a global setting. Well, what are some things your fellow students might be able to do? Well, yeah, there are so many ways that we can all get involved in our schools, homes, or communities to just implement some of these greener practices into our daily lives. Right. So whether it be just uh, starting a campaign in your school where you're letting students know to turn off the lights when they're the last ones out of the classroom. Um, this way that this way that lights are only being used when the classroom is in use um, instead of the whole day um, of school hours. Uh, there's also, you can start little compost uh, piles in your classroom. We've been talking about that today. Uh, not as big as this maybe, uh, but just enough to, yeah, get your <laughs> own garden started in your uh, school. Um, that way you can see from the beginning of what it takes to grow those vegetables or those fruits or those flowers that uh, you would like to see in your school. Uh, something with your friends could be an upcycling um, initiative. You can ha have fun with it and go into each other's houses, mm -hmm. uh, take stuff that are no longer in use that you would otherwise just throw away. I think they threw a poll up for us a bit ago. Um, yes. Do we know what, what won the poll over there? Meatless Mondays. Meatless Mondays. That's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Um, and, if, so, go ahead. And, and if you have any other projects, please feel free to put them in the chat and share with all of us. So those are some really cool things. You're over that at the high school. We've learned that here at the school that's on campus. Are you guys doing anything at the zoo school? Yeah, so like I previously mentioned about uh, turning off the lights and mm -hmm. stuff like that, we've really made it a big thing at zoo school. We have little stickers that we put on top of the switches. Um, it's especially okay. useful in the bathrooms because, you know, the bathrooms aren't always in use, so if they're not, the lights could be off. And it's the responsibility of the last person yeah. um, to turn them off. We also have like a multi-purpose room where people just hang out, eat lunch, play ping pong. Um, if they have any trash left over, um, we have different bins to organize it so that it just all doesn't get thrown into one bag. It's all separated and it could go to its corresponding bin. So you kind of make it easy. Yes, easier for recycling the recycling and everything else. That's, yeah. kind of, that's kind of cool. One kind of fun thing we do at the zoo to kind of go along with your upcycling. If I'm not kind of going into your friend's house and looking for them, I could do something with that. I can do something different with that. Uh, we have something here called a use less stuff sale, useless, use less stuff sale. So staff's able to bring um, products into the park, uh, into the zoo, and we sell that and then put that money towards uh, efforts in the county, some of our conservation programs, things along those lines, which is kind of exciting to know that we're trying to do the same type of thing that you guys are doing. And simple, simple things. And then that one, we're actually able to put the money into something else. We're kind of making that do a do a dual purpose. Recycle the stuff and then make sure that we're putting some money into what we got. I think that does it for us. Oh, did you notice that we, they asked us to meet at the aging pile? I wonder why they asked us to eat here at the, meet, at the aging pile. I think they placed us here because yeah. of you, Steve. Because of me? Yes, because of you. Aging. Yes, because of you. Whatever, Natalie. Let's go, let's go catch up with Leslie and some more experts. See what's going on over here. <laughs> hey, guys. <now>. So, uh, <laughs> we have a couple of minutes. I know, right? <laughs> Lydia will cry. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> so we have a couple of quick minutes before we wrap this up that we can answer some more questions. So if you have any quick questions for us, feel free uh, to let us know. Um, and 
Yeah, so does, do any of you guys have any questions for? Mm. Oh, it looks, it looks like we have a question. How often do we go to Uganda to work with Unite? Oh, that's a great question. I actually, I happen to know that because I was just talking, but here comes Beth, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was just asking Beth that earlier today, so great question, Beth. How often do we go to Uganda? <laughs> we often go twice a year, okay. usually in January for a planning session, so we can plan the year of activities for the teachers and students. And then we go in June so we can participate in one of the teacher workshops and see what they're doing and also school field trips. So twice a year. Twice a year. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what, uh, what is uh, the best way to compost? What is the best way to compost? Do you have any suggestions for that, George? It's all relative to your situation. You know, it can be <laughs> thermy composting with earthworms if you don't have, you're in an apartment. If you have a backyard, you can always find, you know, a few square feet to, to start some kind of composting. Of course, if you get on this level, like we show, <laughs> and you got to think about equipment and a lot more space. So it's really relative, but there's no reason that you cannot compost. No, anywhere we, or any situation. I agree. We actually have okay. at uh, Kid Zone here at the zoo, we, we have a tumbler that's kind of like, yeah. you know, bigger than a little bucket, but yeah. smaller than what yeah. we have here in our yeah. compost area. And they're, they're able to um, kind of get large amounts of compost in there. And that's one of the ways that you can yeah. as well. I was going to say, don't you have a tumbler over zoo school now? Yes, we do. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah, so even at the zoo school, we've been able to do that. That's really awesome thing here. Um, so do we have any other questions? Looks like we do, yeah. Uh, someone asked how George, uh, what made you want this job or how did you get this job? <laughs> nice. The poop sniff. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually came to the zoo uh, because of the zoo's conservation practices. That's really what my incentives were coming. I didn't realize at the time that when I came that the zoo was just starting out trying to compost on a large scale and it just all fell in place because I got to be on in the very beginning and it's just uh, composting organics uh, environmental issues have always just something I've been doing my whole life so that's how I got in very cool well I think that's probably it for um, all the time that we have for the questions uh, so thanks, guys, for all of those questions that we had, um, and uh, thanks for coming out. Did you have anything left to say, Steve or Natalie? Yeah, just uh, thank you so much, and can you please tell us how you're feeling about this experience today using emojis? Yeah, and once again, thank you guys so very much for coming out today on behalf of myself, and Natalie, Leslie, Bob, George, you met Beth, and all of you behind the scenes you don't see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we truly appreciate you guys being part of this very first effort of the North Carolina Zoo's Living um, with Nature series. Uh, tune in again February 27th. It's our next one. That's going to be all about some local conservation efforts. You'll meet some new zoo folks. And if you want to check something else, there's a new thing we're going to show you. Check out a new sneak preview coming up. It's by Untamed Science, but the science of compost that was filmed right here at the North Carolina Zoo. So check this out and get out there and make a difference, guys. Bye. Bye, guys.